You have some time to look at questions one to seven now. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, Megan speaking. Hello, Megan. Hello, Ken. I'm glad you called. Thomas asked me to give you his telephone number. Is that his office number or his home number? I can give you both. His new home number is nine four five two three four five six. Would you like his office number? I think I have it. Does nine seven three one four three two two sound right? That's it. But the home number. Is nine four five two three four five six. He moved in last week. Good, I've got that. Now, what would you like to do? Well, I'd like to go dancing, but Jane's hurt her ankle, so she'd rather not. That's a pity. I guess it means she doesn't want to play tennis either. That's right. She says it's okay to go bowling if we don't expect her to do well. Okay, let's do it. I guess we can go dancing some other time. Well, I booked us some time at the bowling alley of Entertainment City. Do you know it? Is it on Smith Street, down near the university? That's right. It's on the corner of Smith Street and Bridge Road. What time did you book for? The first booking I could get was eight o'clock. Okay, it's seven now. What do you want to do first? Well, I think we should leave now. We can meet at the bowling alley. I can't be that quick. I have to call Thomas to start with, and I need to get changed. Okay, I think I'll leave in ten minutes and meet you in there. That makes sense. I'll take my car, so I'll be quite quick. I'll be out of here in half an hour. Okay. You're so lucky to have a car. You can get around so easily. Well, yes, and no. I often spend ages driving around trying to find a park. The traffic can be very bad. Well, that won't be a problem for me because I'll take the bus. It goes right past my door, and I'll have plenty of time. Sounds good. Who else is coming? I think nearly everyone from the afternoon class will be there. Which class? The big maths class or the afternoon tutorial? The maths class. What's more, we get a concession for large numbers. That's good. I'm trying to keep my expenses down this month. So am I. I expect tonight will cost about twenty dollars. You must be good with money. I expect it to come to、hmm, nearly forty dollars. So how are you going to manage that? Well, the bus is cheap, and if I come home early, I won't have time to spend too much. In any case, I have to be up early tomorrow morning, so I'd really better try to get home by about eleven. That reminds me, I have to phone the taxi company for my mother. Goodbye, Megan. I'll see you later. Goodbye, Ken. Ken calls the taxi company. First, look at questions eight and. Thank you for calling Acme Cabs. Please follow the instructions on the tape. If you wish to order a cab now, press one. 
If you have placed an order previously, press 2. If you wish to make an advance order, press 3. Please be ready to tell us your street number and name. If you wish to speak to the radio room supervisor, press 4. If you want to inquire about lost property, press 5. If you want to order a taxi equipped to carry wheelchairs, press 6. Your call is very important. Please stay on the line for the next available order taker. Hello. I think I left something in one of your cabs on Thursday. It was a brown paper package with an address written on it in green ink. Has anyone handed it in? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Joanna. What's the matter? You look a bit depressed. Hi, Kamal. I've just been reading this article in the newspaper about how difficult it is for sociology students to get a job after they graduate. They always want people with work experience. How do you get work experience if they won't give you a job? It's an impossible situation. Yes, I know. It's a real problem. And the article says that some people spend a year or more living at home doing unpaid voluntary work just to get something to put on their CVs. Really boring stuff like photocopying and addressing envelopes. I don't want to do anything like that. I want a real job. It's the elections for the Students' Union committee posts next month here at the university. All the positions are up for election. Academic officer, sports What's officer... What's your point? And the position of Equal Opportunities Officer is coming up for election. I'm still not sure what you're getting at. Why don't you stand for it? The post starts in June. You're well known at the university, and I think you would be good at it. Equal Opportunities Officer? That sounds great. Isn't that the Students' Union Officer who promotes equality within the university? Yes, that's right. They raise awareness of equal opportunities for everyone in the university and promote the issue around campus. I'd love to do something for women on campus, but what about my studies? It's a paid sabbatical post. Sabbatical? Yes. That means you take a year off and then start your studies again. Meanwhile, you get really good work experience and you can earn money at the same time. That sounds really interesting. But how do I get elected? You go to the Students' Union, fill in an application form and just give it to the Union. Then, I guess, you need to put together a manifesto and try to get people to support you. I'll help you with your campaign, and I'll help you with publicity materials like posters for the notice boards and leaflets to hand out to everyone. It sounds really exciting. What exactly does the Equal Opportunities Officer do? I'm not really sure. Let's have a look at the Students' Union website. There it is. Hmm... The Equal Opportunities Officer is responsible for anything which concerns women and equal rights and is responsible to the Students' Union Executive Committee for making sure that any racism or sexism is dealt with. Students' Union Officers have to be available for students to talk about any problems they have and try to help them. 
I would love that part of the job, giving help and advice to students. The whole reason I want to work in social services is to help people. That would be very good experience. It's a big responsibility too. It also says that you're in charge of a budget and you would be responsible for managing a team of people. It's good experience for a management position in the future. Now I'm getting really excited. What about the day-to-day -day responsibilities? It says here that the Equal Opportunities Officer acts on any health and safety issues. The Equal Opportunities Officer represents all the students on university committees like the Safety Committee and the Equal Opportunities Committee. Lots of meetings then. I don't think I would enjoy all those meetings quite so much. My first aid certificate might be useful for safety issues. Very useful. And you would supervise the running of the crash, make sure that students with young children have access to childcare, that sort of thing. Oh look, the Equal Opportunities Officer also has responsibility for the university bus service. Perhaps I could even get it to run on time. No, don't be too ambitious. We have to get you elected first. Let's take a walk to the union office. Maybe we can meet the Equal Opportunities Officer and talk to her about the job. Great, let's go. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. That's about all I want to say about the course and coursework. As you heard, it's very intensive and there's a lot of work to do. So, how to deal with all the work? It's really important to make sure you have good study skills. It makes the difference between failing, just passing or doing well on any course. There are workshops given by student service counsellors on study skills but I just want to put you in the picture with a quick overview of useful study skills. There are five points I want to make here. The main thing is to get organised. The first thing you need to do, as soon as you get your timetable and reading list, is to draw up a plan of study. Time management is what all students are bad at. Unfortunately, it's what they need to be very good at. Make up a timetable and put in all the things like lab work, lectures, seminars and tutorials that you will attend. Make a note of exactly what work you will do for each of your courses. Where do we get that from? Your lecturer will tell you exactly how you will be assessed at the end of the course. Make sure that you add in time for reading, preparing seminars and so on. Put deadlines into your study plan and put these deadlines into your computer to remind you when they are. With deadlines you need to be realistic and know yourself. Are you the kind of person who leaves things to the last minute? If you are, make sure you remind yourself about deadlines well in advance. Don't leave things to the last minute. That sounds like me. Aim to have a balanced life of academic work, a paid job if you need one, and social activities. As a rough guide, you should be doing 40 hours of academic work per week and 5 to 15 hours for a part-time job, no more. The second point is don't be late or miss lectures. Remember, the person giving the lecture is probably the same person who sets your exams. In lectures, you hear information from the person who will be testing you on it. You will take much longer to gather it from other sources. Classes offer an opportunity to ask questions about difficult material, and you won't miss extra information. Thirdly, make sure that you regularly reread your notes from lectures, books and handouts. This will help you remember what you have done. Finally, two more important points. We expect you to work long hours on your own. The information we give you in tutorials and lectures is just a starting point, often comprising the main points of themes of the subject. After this, it's up to you to go into detail about the topic and be familiar enough on certain points to give a seminar on it if asked. The next and last point is this. You need to think about what you read and any information you get on a topic. We are looking for students who can evaluate material critically, students who can think critically, 
Students who simply read and remember information do not make as good progress as students who think about the subject and form their own opinions on it, based on looking at the subject from all points of view. So we are not just learning facts and figures. Facts and figures are an important part of learning, but not the most important thing. It's what you do with them that is critical. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a radio program in which the speakers discuss the importance of looking after old people in winter. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now, listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen and answer the questions. Nobody likes cold weather, but for old people it can be particularly uncomfortable and dangerous. They can become cold without even noticing it. To keep warm, they may need help from friends and neighbors like you. To find out how we can help, we've invited a representative from the social service department at the town hall to talk about the winter warmth code campaign. Mr. Hastings, can I first ask you why it is so important to keep an eye on elderly people during cold weather such as we've been having lately? Yes, there are two main reasons. First, the old suffer from the cold more than the rest of us. They're not as active or strong as you and me, and it's harder for them to keep warm. This can lead to all sorts of complications. They have less resistance to infection. The quality of their lives is badly affected, and in extreme cases, they may need to be hospitalized. According to the newspapers, old people are actually dying of the cold. Is this true? I'm afraid it is. I said before there were two main reasons why we should keep an eye on old people. Well, the other major problem is that so many pensioners cannot afford to heat their homes properly. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. They may already be living in difficult circumstances. Then, in an exceptionally cold winter such as this one, they may just not have enough money to pay for the extra heating necessary. It seems terrible that in a society such as ours, this should be happening. It is, and. What the Winter Warmth Code campaign aims to do is to bring this problem to the attention not only of the government but of everybody else in society. We all have a duty towards our old people to make sure that they do not suffer in this cold weather. So now to the practical side of things, what can we do to help? Well, we all know someone old, a relative maybe, a neighbor, 
someone living round the corner. We should adopt that person and make sure that we spare a few minutes every day to check that everything is okay. Make sure, even if the old person is not actually ill, that he or she is not suffering. Check when you go inside that the house or flat doesn't feel cold to you. It's a good idea to try to feel some part of their body, like their face or hands. Old people can become cold without even noticing it, you know. Okay, and if a person is too poor to afford to heat the house or flat? The best thing then is for the old person to live in one room only and to make sure that that one room is warm. Check that the bed is on an inside wall. Move it yourself if necessary. Check the room for drafts. A lot of cold air gets into the room through old windows or badly fitting doors. Is food important? Yes. Make sure that the old person is eating well. You could help by cooking for them or doing the shopping. Remember, a good hot meal a day makes a big difference. Also, make sure that they are well dressed. Old people need to wear more layers of clothes than we do, particularly at night. One last question, Mr. Hastings. Is there nothing the state can do to help? Oh, yes, indeed. Contact your town hall to find out about local organizations already involved in this kind of work. If there is a local Meals on Wheels service, for instance, you could get your adopted old person on the list. Then, of course, there are also many state benefits which an old person could be entitled to, and which he or she doesn't know about, and which therefore he or she is not claiming. An extra problem here is that it can often be complicated, and old people don't like going to Social Security offices to fill in forms and all that. You can help by finding out for them what possibilities exist for claiming a little extra money from the government, then applying for it for them. That little extra could make all the difference. Yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Hastings, thank you for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the following talk between two friends and answer the questions with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Do you know what, Tom? It won't be long before we'll all be travelling to space in a cable car. A cable car? What do you mean? A sort of sky lift? Well, yes, I suppose so. You must be joking. Where on earth did you get that idea from? Oh, I've just been reading it in a book called... Apes to Astronauts by Adrian Berry. He's the science correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, so he should know what he's talking about. He says, wait a minute, I've got it here, page 28. A cable car to the heavens. 
Oh, honestly, Jane, you surely don't believe all that stuff you read in those sci-fi books. It's not science fiction. It's a fact. Hang on, I read you what he says. The space writer Arthur C. Clarke, to whose inspiration we owe the communication satellite, recently outlined a proposal for a new means of space travel, which he admitted is so outrageous. That many of you may consider it not even science fiction, but pure fantasy. Shall I go on? No, just tell me how he thinks it could be done. Well, it sounds quite simple, really. One end of a cable, twenty-three thousand miles long. How long? Twenty-three thousand miles. Do listen. One end of a cable, twenty-three thousand miles long. Would be attached to a point on the Earth's equator, and the other to a satellite in geostationary orbit. So, the cable would be absolutely tight between the two points, and the elevator would travel up and down, carrying people and freight. According to Arthur Clarke, it's the only way to travel in space without using rocket engines, which would make it much more economical. I wonder. If it would be more comfortable, it sounds pretty uncomfortable to me, and heaven knows what speed it'd be travelling at.、Uh, what would happen if the cable broke? Oh, he explains all that. Apparently, the most likely place for it to break would be at or near the ground, and if that happened, it wouldn't fall down; it would fall upwards. Upwards? Hmm. Yes, I suppose it would. Yes, sounds funny, doesn't it? Something falling upwards. Anyway, it wouldn't matter too much either if the cable broke away from the high end; it'd remain rigid until it could be reattached to the satellite. I don't quite see why. Well, it would be the pull of gravity from above. Anyway, who'd want to be stuck in an elevator attached to a rigid cable thousands of miles up in space? I suppose he doesn't say what would happen if it broke in the middle. Actually, he does. He says it would be dangerous if the break occurred at any altitude up to fifteen thousand miles, because the bit attached to the Earth would, what does he say? Oh yes, collapse and wrap itself around the equator like a whiplash. Whiplash. You know, the long bit of cord or leather on a whip. Anyway. Even that would only be really catastrophic if the cable was made of steel or some other metal. Metals are much too heavy. The cable would have to be made of some material capable of suspension without snapping. But I thought you said the cable would be twenty-three thousand miles long. I did, but the three thousand mile breaking length is because of gravity. Well, all I can say is, you'll never catch me going to space in a cable car. I'd rather keep my feet on the ground. Thank you very much. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.